Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Word of God, which we shall consider, is written in the 19th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning at the first verse. This is the story of Jesus coming to the home of Zacchaeus, the, chat, uh, the tax collector. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This is the word of the Lord. Beloved fellow outsiders to the kingdom of God. In Jesus' day, tax collectors were despised. They collected exorbitant amounts of money when they went out to get the taxes, more than they were required to give to the Roman authorities. And they had Roman soldiers to back them up. So the people were forced to give more than they knew they had to pay. And they didn't like tax collectors at all. They regarded them as extortioners and as people who were collaborators with the hated Romans. Zacchaeus was a Jewish man. His name is Jewish. But he had kind of turned his back on his own people. Because anyone who was going to collect taxes for the Romans would not be accepted by his fellow uh, Jews. So, we find and uh, he was wealthy. He was a chief tax collector. Luke doesn't spell that out exactly. It may be that he ruled a certain or ran a certain administrative uh, segment of the tax collection system. Or perhaps he was the chief tax collector over all of Judea. At any rate, he was a wealthy man and not thought of very well at all. Now this story is the story of how a very unlikely man found salvation. Can you think of anything in your life more important than that? Than finding salvation? No matter how successful you are, Zacchaeus was wealthy, he was doing all kinds of good things. But something was missing. He knew that he should have been back where his parents had taught him to be. 
and he knew that no matter how successful he was, he needed the God of Israel. Well, the same thing is true for us. It doesn't make any difference how well you do, how well you're thought of, or what. The only thing that really matters in life is whether or not you have found salvation. So, this morning, let's consider how you get Jesus' salvation into your life. In the story of Zacchaeus, Luke tells us that there are three things you have to do, and all of them are necessary. First, you have to climb a tree. Second, you have to see past the crowds. And third, you must welcome Jesus into your life. The first and the biggest barrier to truly having Jesus' salvation in your life is pride. Now, Luke doesn't tell us a whole lot about Zacchaeus. Maybe Zacchaeus knew, since this is getting close to the time when Jesus' ministry was ending, maybe Zacchaeus knew that Jesus had called Matthew <coughs> or Levi, who was a tax collector, to be his disciple. And now he heard that Jesus was coming, and he thought, you know, I've got to find out about this guy. If Matthew went back to his roots, perhaps I can go back as well. But pride can keep you away, can it? Think of Zacchaeus' pride for a minute couple of things. He didn't rise to be the chief tax collector at 24. So he's at best a middle-aged man. And he's kind of a short little guy. So he wants to see Jesus. But everybody wants to see Jesus. All the people in Jericho are crowding around. Jesus is passing through on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to suffer and die. And Zacchaeus can't see Jesus. I guess if we were making a movie, we could picture him jumping up and down, trying to see if Jesus is coming, sure that he's going to miss him. So what does he decide to do? He decides he's going to climb a tree. <clears throat> Can you imagine how he looked? <coughs> So here's this little guy, maybe in his 50s, maybe early 60s, and he's scrambling up this tree. The man has no pride at all. He looked like an idiot up there, a grown man climbing up a tree. You wouldn't think anything of a youngster climbing up a tree, or maybe even a young man. But imagine perhaps the uh, mayor of the area climbing up in a tree. Well, you want to get that picture from the newspaper. Pride. It didn't stop Zacchaeus. What about us? What about us? What can keep us from really welcoming Jesus into our lives? Oh, we can say to ourselves, well, you know, I've already done it. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. But have you really welcomed Jesus into your life? We're going to talk about that when we see Jesus coming to the home as it is. But a lot of times, we go right through life, and someone who knows us casually might not even know that we were Christians. Because you don't do, you know, you don't, uh, make a big deal out of that uh, in your everyday life. People will think less of you. So what tree is it that you have to climb? How might you need to look foolish because you really want to see Jesus? 
And Zacchaeus had another problem that goes along with the pride that uh, he threw away to climb up in that tree, and that is seeing past the crowds. Again, if you were making a movie of this, you'd show Zacchaeus trying to wedge his way through the crowd with no success at all. And you know why? They don't want to let him in. Maybe they have to pay him taxes, but there are no soldiers here to insist, so everybody is just crowding together, and Zacchaeus is out of luck. He needs to get up in that tree. He needs to see past the crowds. The same thing is true for us as well, isn't it? Crowds, in Jesus' day and Zacchaeus' day, were certainly a nasty bunch. They didn't want to have anything to do with this tax collector, and they weren't giving him a favored place in the front. They didn't care about him at all. <clears throat> the crowds in our lives are something like that, too. They aren't interested in you being a child of God. They are not likely to be interested in your Christian faith. They may make fun of you if you stand too firmly for your Savior. So if you want to get Jesus' salvation into your life, you have to be able to see past the crowds. That brings us to the third and perhaps the most important point. So, number one, you have to climb a tree. <clears throat> number two, you have to see past the crowds. And the third thing is you have to welcome Jesus into your life. Now, notice that Zacchaeus had no idea at all that Jesus would come into his life. So there isn't anything here about Zacchaeus accepting Jesus or giving his life to Jesus. There's nothing at all. This really isn't about Zacchaeus, the wealthy tax collector, at all. It's about Jesus. So it isn't a matter of making a decision for Christ. It's the Savior who comes into our lives. When Jesus reached the spot where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Notice all of the phrases. I must stay at your house. He isn't just going to eat a meal. He's going to be at Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus welcomed him. Gladly, he was honored that the Savior would come to his house and even his, Jesus' enemies. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Why in the world would this famous prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, stay with that bum Zacchaeus who cheats and steals and who is a traitor to his own people. But all of the things that Luke tells us have to do with being a part of Zacchaeus' house. I'm going to stay at your house. And he welcomed him. And people are offended that he would eat and stay at the home of a sinner. When Jesus says to Zacchaeus, I'm coming home with you, he's teaching us two things. The first thing is that we should note the order of grace, the order of God's undeserved love. Zacchaeus doesn't say, Savior, as he calls out, Jesus, Lord, whatever he might have called him. I'm going to stop cheating people. I'm going to straighten up and fly right. He doesn't say any of those things. 
And Jesus doesn't respond, oh good, I'm glad that you're going to straighten things out. Now I'm going to come to your house. Jesus doesn't really know anything about Zacchaeus other than the fact that he wants to see him. And he says, I'm going to come home with you. Zacchaeus hasn't even repented. He didn't do any of the things that a Christian is supposed to do. But you see, it doesn't start with us. It starts with God. Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' life. I remember when uh, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz wants to get a hearing before the grand, uh, wonderful uh, fellow that will help her out. He doesn't say to her, oh, I'll just give you this. No, he says to Dorothy, get me the broom of the Wicked Witch of the West, and then I'll give you an audience. But you see, this is the order of creation. It isn't us figuring out what we need to do and making us worthy of coming to Jesus. It doesn't work that way at all. So what's going on here? What's happening? Well, Jesus gets to the home of Zacchaeus. And what exactly occurs? He says... Lord, it's, uh, well, uh, look, Lord, he says, look what I've done, or what I'm going to do. I love that phrase. Look, Lord. It's like the little boy or girl comes up, look, Daddy, look, look what I've done. It isn't Zacchaeus bragging. Uh, if, if you read it that way, you're your misunderstanding. Jesus would have put that down immediately. He would have gotten rid of that. He wants to show Jesus what has happened in his life. What's Jesus saying? I don't care about your flaws, Zacchaeus. I don't care that you cheated, that you did all of these things. I still love you. I still care about you. He isn't telling him that it's all right to do those things. And Zacchaeus knows it. Zacchaeus, at the invitation of Jesus, is prepared to turn his life around. You see the emotion in Zacchaeus. In the, in the face of the grace of Jesus Christ for him, for Jesus' love for this outsider, Zacchaeus embarks on an adventure of grace. An adventure of salvation. Look at what he says. Grace always changes you. That's the second thing. Look at how it changed Zacchaeus' life. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That isn't what was required. He was required to give a tenth, not half of everything he had. But Zacchaeus was wealthy. And so he could give half away. And because he felt so wonderful as a child of God that that's exactly what he intended to do. He, when he cheated somebody, the law, the Old Testament book of Numbers, said that you needed to pay back anyone you cheated and give them 20%. But Zacchaeus is going to give them four hundred percent. He's on an adventure of grace and of salvation. Because this changes, Jesus changes the life of everyone into whom 
He comes with his salvation. Now here's where things start to get a little uncomfortable for us. We're not like Zacchaeus. Previous to today, you haven't spent your life living without God and doing whatever you wanted and ignoring things. No, you came here this morning because you're a child of God. But sometimes we get accustomed to that. I'm going to take it for granted. And we lose this sense that Zacchaeus has that we want to say to the Lord, look, Lord, look at what you have done in my life. I am rejoicing in being able to do wonderful things because you made it possible. That's what the story of Zacchaeus is about. You know, all the phrases that Luke tells us, you know, I'm going to stay at your house. Zacchaeus welcomes him. Jesus' enemies say he's eating in the home of a sinner. All of those phrases remind us how much Jesus came into Zacchaeus' life. He didn't just say something to him. You know, the evening meal in those days was very important. The day's work was done and it was time to eat. But what are you going to do after dinner? Well, maybe we'll go to a movie, maybe we'll watch a little television. Who knows what we might do? But not in those days. They had these little oil lamps. So you would enjoy eating the meal and you took a long time doing that and when you were done, you went to bed. So Jesus was going to stay at Zacchaeus' house. He was going to be a part of everything that was happening in Zacchaeus. Jesus wanted everything to change. He wanted to be part, you know the phrase, the warp and the woof of life? Maybe that sounds strange to you. If you're making a rug, the warp and the woof are the different threads. Some run this way and some run this way on a loom. So if you're part of the warp and the woof of someone's life, you're part of everything. Jesus cares about how you think of your job, how you think of your marriage, how you think of your schoolwork, how you think of everything. And he comes with salvation for those things. So it isn't just a matter of something that we do on Sunday morning. No. Jesus wants to be part of every part of our lives. Everything that we think about, whether you take a job or you don't take a job, how you raise your children, how you act sexually as a man or a woman, everything. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Jesus wants to be part of that life. Can he do that? Can he make a change like that for you? He did for Zacchaeus. It's wonderful to see the Zacchaeus rejoicing, isn't it? Look, Lord, look what I'm able to do. I never did this before. I worried about me. But everything has changed since you come into my life with your salvation. But can Jesus change your life? Can he make a change in the life of someone who's taken salvation for granted for a long time. I know how easily I can do that. I'm sure that's true of you as well. Jesus came to save outsiders. The danger for us, of course, is that we don't see ourselves as outsiders. Zacchaeus did. Again, remember him trying to get it his way through the crowd, ignoring what people thought of him, climbing up in a tree. None of that mattered to him at all. He was an outsider, and he wanted to be an insider. 
He wanted to be a part of what Jesus had to offer. We're outsiders too. We may not recognize it. God has been gracious to us and brought us in, but we begin to take that for granted. We need to realize that we always were outsiders. How does Jesus change that in your life? Jesus went from being an insider to an outsider. Just think of how Jesus was an insider. He was part of the Trinity. He dwelt in heaven. He lived in the bosom of his heavenly Father. You can't get to be more of an insider than that. But what happened? The bond between Jesus and his heavenly Father was broken. The Savior became an outsider. You don't get more outside than someone who cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He became an outsider for us because of what we had done. He carried the load of sin that we had committed that separated us from God, became the ultimate outsider so that we could be an insider. Rejoice in everything that the Lord has done for you. Welcome the Savior into every part of your life. Come to the meal that He has hosted in Holy Communion. Accept His grace and mercy into your life.